Hamid, great to see you again. Of course, I have to start with the news. You made a very public offer this week, all stock for Duke Realty, one of your biggest competitors. And just yesterday, they made a very public rejection of this. Why did you feel that now was the time to do this, especially given all the supply chain issues? And what's your next move, given that rejection? Diana, good morning, and I hope you're doing well. It's been a while. Um, it, uh, the timing of the offer was not actually uh, this week. The timing of our dialogue started about six months ago. So we have a great business as it is. Uh, we have scale. We have the opportunity to serve clients around the world. And the addition of another good company would actually enable us to do that even better. But we are very disciplined in our approach, and I probably better stop there because uh, of all the legal limitations that I'm under. Uh, but uh, either way, it's going to work out great for our shareholders, and I hope uh, that uh, the other company will also take a decision that would be really good for their shareholders. Um, so despite the rejection, you're still moving forward? Well, the, uh, the shareholders really clearly know what it is that we've offered, and they have an option, and they can decide what they want to do with that. At the end of the day, uh, the leadership of the company and the board, I think they're going to do the right thing, uh, but the shareholders need, need to express their view on, on our offer, which they will, okay. I think. Okay. Um, I want to move into the, you know, the elephant in the room, which is always supply chain, especially when it comes to your business. You have a great front row seat to it through Amazon. Give us an update on what you're seeing. We're, t we're hearing some improvement in some areas, but, you know, I cover real estate and every home builder or contractor I talk to is still waiting for windows and doors, et cetera, uh, and other things in the construction industry. What are you seeing now in supply chain? Any improvement? Yeah, there are some improvements, but every time we gain a couple of steps, we step back a little bit. For example, this uh, recent shutdown in China uh, because of the new variant is obviously introducing another wrinkle that uh, we were hoping we would not have to deal with earlier in the year. So every time uh, there's something new. Uh, but to look back, we need to understand the cause of these supply chain problems. And they go back to policies in the last 10 or 20 years where companies have really, in the interest of efficiency, squeezed their supply chains. Uh, they've tried to get away with less and less inventory. And yet the customer demand, the end customer's demand, is for uh, more goods, more variety, and quicker. So those two things are in conflict with one another. One, uh, one means that we're trying to get a higher return on capital by reducing inventories. And the other means that we got to have a lot of inventories around to serve the customers. And when you have something like the pandemic, or you have a political issue, or you have war, all these things take these highly engineered supply chains and race havoc with them. And as a result, bottlenecks emerge, and they have to be dealt with. Now, the acute phase of, of all of this was last year uh, leading up to Christmas. And uh, companies were solely focused on getting through the Christmas season. I think after the Christmas season, there's been some relief, and companies have had the ability to catch up a little bit. But like we said last year, everybody was, uh, was talking about this problem going, uh, going away in 2022. We were in the camp that said 23, 24. I think it's going to be a while. Uh, before we get back to what you would consider normal, unless the world goes back to a very benign uh, place where everything works out the way the engineers <laughs> plan it. Which, and I don't think we're in that kind of a world. Yeah, I would say that's unlikely, highly unlikely. Um, given that, given the pandemic, given all these supply situations, how did you evolve the model, the business model at Prologis? And specifically when it came to labor, um, we know there's a labor shortage out there and it still continues, but how did you evolve that model to deal with all these changes? Well, um, you know, it starts uh, uh, with, with prepare, preparation. And we really set our strategy about 15, 20 years ago uh, we reduced our f footprint in out-of-the-way areas and focused our real estate in major metro areas where the ma majority of the consumption takes place. And we got really close to the end customers uh, by being in these population centers. So that was really the foundation of, uh, of being ready for this. And over time, we just kept our ears wide open uh, listening to our customers. Historically, real estate has not been a customer-centric business. 
frankly, most people didn't really care who their landlord was, and they just cared about price and location. But when you're in our business, if you're in a logistics business, you're not just leasing one building. The successful companies are leasing 100 buildings. And the quality of the network and the quality of the company from whom you lease space and the services that that company provides become all of a sudden really important because those customers want to go about doing their business. They don't want to get into our business and deal with all the issues that we should be solving for them. But historically, our industry hasn't been structured to solve for. One of those issues is labor. And uh, starting about five years ago, we kept hearing from our customers that their number one, number two, and number three problems had to do with the availability of labor. And this started long before the pandemic, and it just got more acute as a result of the pandemic. So uh, about three, three and a half years ago, we started an initiative uh, called the Prologis Community Workforce Initiative. We started it in LA, went to Miami, then went to Chicago, and are now rolling it out globally. And it's really a curriculum and a certification process to train uh, workers in the logistics business, which is one of the biggest new net creators of jobs. And these are now good jobs. They're paying uh, quite well. And they're a perfect entry level or even mid-career jobs for a lot of people that used to be employed in retail or hospitality or some of the other industries that, that were shedding people. So um, our goal is to train 25,000 people by 2025. We've already trained 13,000 people. We placed a lot of them in good productive jobs. And as part of that process, we've gotten closer to the customers and understand now better their other issues. And we're tackling those other issues uh, like energy, like mobility, like electrification of their, of their fleets, uh, many, many other issues that are surrounding and adjacent to the real estate um, that we lease to them. And that's been, I think that's going to be actually a huge engine for our growth going forward. There are not many businesses where you have a five to 10 year relationship with a customer. And that customer's need uh, uh, changes during those, that five or 10 year period. And you're in the best position by virtue of our scale and purchasing power to provide products and services to them at a very efficient and inexpensive uh, way. So that's where our focus is. So you faced war, you faced a pandemic, you faced a labor issue. Now you're facing rising interest rates as well as inflation. How do you think that's going to affect consumers and e-commerce and everything that goes into your business? Well, certainly the consumer is facing headwinds. I mean, they're paying a lot more for gas, they're paying a lot more for food and other things. And uh, so the customer is getting uh, squeezed. The good news is, that they're making it up in wages, maybe not in its entirety, but they're making up some of those headwinds uh, in, in rising wages. So that's a, that's a good sign. Also, the market is very tight in terms of employment. And uh, I think uh, normally, in a, in a normal year, we're 5 to 6% unemployment rate. Today, we're much lower than that. So the economy is very strong, and there are lots of opportunities for people to get in, attracted into the workforce because of these higher wages. So um, I, I don't think the news is all bad. The, we live in a very volatile world. I don't want to minimize a huge loss of life and this terrible war that's happening in Europe. That's uh, certainly affecting our business, actually affecting our business in a positive way, but affecting our people in a negative way. For example, we have lots of employees in Poland now that, uh, that have a surge of people coming in from the Ukraine, and they're housing these people in their homes and all that. But actually, that disruption has added to the strength of our business in Europe, because the supply chain is more messed up. People need places to put things that are not complete, and that increases demand on logistics. So disruption is bad for the economy, but it's actually good for the logistics business. We don't need that to, to make money for our shareholders. We, we hope that goes away. We want to make our money by serving our customers and that. Uh, but this has been a, an added element that has made our business actually stronger. And, and so did COVID. So any kind of disruption really ultimately creates more demand for warehouse space because that's where goods go when they're incomplete and can't get to the consumer.
Interesting. And you talked earlier about how consumers are demanding that that be closer to where they are, that things get delivered faster. And of course, your clients want to be able to do that. Let's talk about land for a minute. We have land shortage. You want to be as close into the cities as possible. Uh, real estate costs are way up and there's not a lot of available land. How are you wrapping your head around that? So, um, you know, that's a really, really interesting question, because if you look at it, there are other people that have faced these problems in the world and they've dealt with it. For example, in Japan, it's a country with over 100 million people and the landmass of California and lots of open space and farms. So they've had to dens densify uh, their logistic uh, operations. So they go multi-story. In, in the U.S., historically, land costs have been lower. Uh, so there's been no incentive uh, to go vertical because it's more expensive. But now I think land prices are getting to a point that intensification of sites is a real uh, possibility um, in, in major urban areas. In fact, we built the first multi-story building in the U.S. in Seattle a couple of years ago and are looking at additional opportunities in the States. Almost every building we build in Japan most of the buildings we build in China, all of those are, um, uh, most of them are multi-story because of the density and the cost of land. So that's the only solution. Uh, municipalities uh, uh, generally are very anti-logistics real estate because historically logistics has created a lot of truck traffic, diesel fumes, and all kinds of things. And people generally don't want uh, warehouses in their, in their residential areas. So I think the solution to that is the electrification of the fleet. I, I think um, we are ahead of this curve and we are have started an EV charging business because we think trucking, long distance trucking and vans, delivery vans are gonna go uh, electric and that's a much lower carbon footprint. So we are, my job is to see around the corner, look into the future and figure out how to position this company uh, to take advantage of the trends that are inevitable. And sustainability and energy are two huge areas of opportunity for our company and we've been working on them, we've been reporting on them, we've been recognized for them uh, for the last 10 or 15 years. So this is not a new thing, but I think we've hit an inflection point. And, and I think going forward, um, we're going to be much, much more active in these businesses. And since you bring it up, I have to ask about climate risk. I mean, real estate is in the front lines, of course, in climate. You talk about where you're choosing your locations. You're talking about your supply chain issues potentially being disrupted by climate change. How are you gauging your risk and how are you also creating, you know, real estate is one of the worst carbon offenders. You talked about electric vehicles, but in the buildings themselves, on both sides, we talk about climate risk disclosure. Disclose if you could. <laughs> So um, um, real estate generates a lot of um, um, carbon, um, basically, and uh, it, people focus on the construction aspect. And actually, there are emerging technologies that are reducing that. There, there's actually concrete that uh, can capture uh, uh, CO2, and there are lots of other technologies that I can walk you through. But at the end of the day, the biggest offender is going to be is currently transportation. So we can get our buildings built with, uh, with a lower impact. That's not a big problem. Getting the fleets and the transportation uh, problem and that carbon out of the air is the bigger challenge. I think there's a limitation on the capacity of vehicles that companies can produce, particularly all the energy has been on cars, basically. And now we need to turn that energy to, to trucks and vans because they're big offenders uh, with respect to this uh, climate issue. Um, climate, it goes into every investment decision that we make. Uh, I mean, we look at the climate risk. These are physical assets that are sitting targets. So uh, we're not only building them in a lower impact way, but we're uh, locating, locating them in locations uh, that are somewhat insulated, not completely. Uh, but from climate effects. So it's a, it's a really big and increasingly bigger and bigger factor in our decision making. But since you are smack in the middle of supply chain, how do you protect your business against supply chain disruptions from climate change, be it fire, flood, storms, et cetera? So again, uh, disruption is uh, actually creates demand for logistics space. So uh, we're not counting on that uh, for, our, uh, for our growth. But all of those things uh, in, in the short term uh, create demand uh, for the supply chain. And companies have realized that. So they're not running 
uh, quite as lean or they don't want to run quite as lean as they were before the pandemic because they now realize that these highly engineered supply chains work great in theory until something breaks. And when something breaks, they really back up in a big way. So one of the opportunities is for them to carry more inventory in the system for increased resilience. And we've done some research in this area. We think there's gonna, this is going to long term at, uh, lead to 5 to 10 percent more inventories, which is about 800 million square feet of additional warehouse demand just in the U.S. And the same thing is going to happen to other, other countries. And so you have this, we had a good business. E-commerce really turbocharged charged it because e-commerce takes three times as much warehouse space than bricks and mortar uh, retail that needs to be supported by warehouses. So that was a big tailwind. Then you had the resilience that has come out of the pandemic and, and the other disruptions. And all of those factors have taken uh, a really good business and turned it into a great business. And on the other side is a supply equation. And for reasons that we talked about, uh, supply is getting more and more difficult to bring on. So as a result of that, you have surging demand uh, sort of clashing with limited supply. And as a result, uh, rents are very strong. Um, our U.S. portfolio is almost 50 percent under rented. That means our leases, if rents go nowhere from here, they just roll over. We can capture about 50 percent upside uh, in our rentals. So um, on top of that, you've got construction costs that are going through the roof. So the next building can't come online unless the rents that it achieves are much higher. So. As an owner of more than a billion square feet of uh, real estate, actually, uh, we're in really good position because we acquired those buildings or built <clears> those buildings with much lower costs, and we're benefiting from this pricing power that we're getting as a result of uh, strong demand and tight supply. And this is not something where you can flip a switch and change it the next day. Uh, this takes years and years, and actually, the trends so far are not conducive to additional supply. They're going the other way.